there will now be an opportunity for silent prayer and or meditation. Please be seated. Order, honorable members. Is there any member that wish to give notice of a motion? Notice of a motion. Now you must just keep your hands there so that I write down all the people because it's quite a few. I'll start this side, TV. I'll come to you. Clute, <laughs> ABC. Are you sitting here now? Oh, you are a traveler here in this place, man. I see you in another seat every day. I'm here now. I'm here now. Jabaling, I love you more than my mother. <laughs> I'm here now, Bosov. The motion without notice, not now the one that said notices of motion. I must also get used to this thing. Notice without motion, please. Notion with that notice with motion without notice, please remember that one of our province. <laughs> and uh, Kahni Taten Jadu without, so you will be in the next first one. You are also there is notices of motion, it is the one that we are starting now. Each and every one, one and a half minutes, maximum 20 minutes. So we will start with ABC, Honorable Clute. Thank you, Chairperson. I hereby give notice that on the next sitting day of the House, I shall move on behalf of the FF Plus that the House debates the end of the brain drain through race based policies such as broad-based black empowerment and affirmative action in South Africa in order to save the South African economy and service delivery. I so move. There is a notice of motion, so I don't think there is any process that need to follow that. Honorable Smith from Limpopo. Thank you, uh, Honorable Deputy Chairperson. It's Honorable Smith without the H. Uh, on behalf of the Democratic Alliance, I move that this council debate at its next sitting the review of the AgriPark's approach to research and develop a model of sustainable, cost-effective support to small-scale and subsistence farmers in South Africa. I so move. The, the, the received the notice of motion. Honorable Mutsamai. Thank you, uh, Deputy Chairperson. Uh, I raise on behalf of the EFF to move that when it means the council must discuss the social economic state of the military veterans and their families and whether or not there are plans for the department to ease the suffering of military veterans during the festive season. I thank you. Moved. That was the Honorable Mutsamai. The Honorable Pabam Fayel. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, I move on behalf of the IFP that the House at its next sitting debates the need for a stricter regulation and controls within the gambling industry, whereby people can set personal limits on amounts they wish to gamble either daily or month. I so move. 
I really hope you, you got it, the table, because I couldn't hear everything that the, uh, the Honorable Mufayela was saying. Sim, it's fine. I'm sure you will, you will hand it into the table, your, your proposal. Honorable Nchabalang. Um, thanks, uh, Deputy Chair. I hereby give notice that in the next sitting of the Council, I shall move that the Council notes that the 14th November marks World Diabetes Day, which is part of the campaign that is led by the International Diabet Diabetes Federation and its member association around the world, including the American Diabetes Association, the Diabetes UK, Diabetes Australia, the Canadian Diabetes Association, Diabetes South Africa, Diabetes New Zealand, and the Diabetic Association of India to raise awareness about the deadly effect of diabetes. Two, further note that statistics from the International Diabetes Federation, the World Health Organization and the Center for Disease Control reveal that worldwide over 415 million people are diabetic. Every six seconds, a person dies from diabetic-related uh, causes. Every 10 seconds, two people develop diabetes, and every 30 seconds, a lower limb is amputated worldwide due to diabetes. And three, in joins the House to debate the deadly impact of diabetes in South Africa, and measures that are geared towards raising awareness about this silent killer. I so move as the ANC. Thank you, Honorable Nchabeleng, Honorable Slavoskarni. Sorry, Chair, I want to do a motion without notice. You want to do a motion without notice, okay. I, yourself and, uh, yes, I'm coming to you. I am writing down those that already indicated that they are going to do a motion without notice. And I have a list of around about one, two, three, four, five, six members. I, yeah, you, you, you can, I covered you. You are covered. Well, you, you still want to give a notice. Okay, I'm coming to you. Because I, I was looking at you and you showed like, it's fine. Members, let me just con conclude the lesson. You must remember it is, there is a time limit to this. It's smaller. Who else here? The toy, I do have, I do have, I do have. Without, no, I'm, 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 I'm watching and you are notice of motion. Or mo I'm coming to you, I'm, con I'm concluding my list because there are many members that want to. Tebo, what is your modice? I'm, I'm concluding the list. I hope we will have enough time. Yeah, mommy, baby. Baba, you want to be here again. Okay. Lehi, Lehi, you want to? You want to? I'm having so many motions. It's because it's long that we didn't have motions. You will speak now. You will speak now, and you will want to speak on both. But you will speak now, yes. I'm just concluding the list so that we don't come back to the same. The two of you also want to speak now. Okay. After this, not now. Smith. What's am I? You don't want to give yours to her. <laughs> yeah, because both of you are speaking. Okay. Be otherwise, the time might not cover all of us. We will now go to Honorable Goya on notice of motion. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Deputy Chair. <clears throat> on behalf of the African National Congress, I hereby give notice that in the next sitting of the Council, I shall move uh, that Council notes and debates Transport Month, which takes place in October, to further advance the country's road safety initiatives while also creating awareness of the economic benefits of the sector, especially transport infrastructure, services in aviation, 
uh, maritime public transport and roads. Further notes that the, this year's Transport Month was launched by the President Cyril Ramaphosa on the 5th of October 2019 in Gauteng and acknowledges that whilst our investment in the transport sector continues to stimulate development and create jobs as part of the country's nine-point plan, the country is still faced with a disconcerting culture of negligence and utmost, and utmost disregard of road safety. I so move. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Goya. That concludes now the, the notices of motion. We are going to, to request, does any member wish to move for motion without notice? We already have a list of members, and we will start with the Honorable Landsman. Again, you didn't, you didn't indicate that. No, 20 minutes have not yet passed you. You can give your notice. Mm. <coughs> Thank you. No, I hereby give a no, notice of a motion. I, I hereby give a motion of a motion in the next setting of council. I shall move that the council, number one, notes that 16, November marks International Day of uh, Tolerance, which is geared towards raising awareness about negative effects of intolerance and how various forms of injustice, oppression, racism, terrorism, homophobia, and unfair discrimination continue to divide individuals and communities around the globe. Two, future notes that International Day of Tolerance also seek to promote tolerance, respect, appreciation, cooperation amongst the world's different cultures, ethnic communities, racial groups, to continue to work together in peace and a united diversity. Three, to take the community opportunity to join the rest of the world to call on people of South Africa on our reach for culture, diversity, and the positivity that has been reignited by the Springboks win for the World Cup in Japan and steering performance of African netball team's performance in 2019 African Netball Cup of Champions at Belvin, Belleville in Cape Town and use this great accomplishments to recommit ourselves to work tirelessly and without any rest to advance our national goal of building a democratic South Africa that is united in our diversity. I so move. Thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable Nzanda Mela. <laughs> Order. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Chair. It breaks my heart because we've had three trainings on this. And, yeah, I don't know. But you are supposed to, with great respect, after a motion without notice, ask the House whether there's any objection on the motion. And then the House goes yes or no. But that step hasn't been taken. So, firstly, that part of the rules needs to be, to be actually um, uh, applied. And secondly, a motion without notice doesn't start that at the next sitting of this House, I shall move that. It actually starts with, I hereby move without notice. It's small little things, but I mean, we can't have a fourth training session. But you are supposed to, with great respect, ask whether this House objects or not. Thank you very much, the Honorable Mikalakis. But all the members indicated that they want to give notices of motion. And that is why we are, not, we are following the process that we are following now. Honorable Zandamela, yes, so Lerons Almal Maran, so Lerons on the Leister work. Thank you, Deputy Chairperson. I, I rise on behalf of the EFF to give a notice without motion that the House in the next sitting debate the state of uh, our municip uh, municipal, uh, our local municipal uh, uh, councils, uh, since many of them in the country are in under Section 139. And in most of them, there's no improvement. So I so move that the house in the next sitting debate the state of our municipalities. Thank you. Then it will be Honorable Moima. Motion now a motion without notice or one with notice? But Chairperson, what is the rule here then? 
there's a 20 minutes time limit for motions. How long is it for motions with notice and how long for mo motions without notice? Can I ask? Can I ask the honourable members one thing? Because you have to announce from Can the I chair. Can I ask the honourable members one thing? Can I use my discretion? Because of the fact that it was very long that we didn't have an opportunity for members to put motion. I know we've got rules, but can I here use my discretion? I'm just asking the honourable members. Yes. I'm using my discretion here. I'm really using my discretion. I would appreciate if other people appreciate it. <laughs> can honourable Moima? Arise in terms of the rule 78 to, to give notice that in the next sitting of the council, uh, I shall move that the council knows that this coming Sunday, 17th November, marks the World Day of Remembrance for Road Traffic Victims. It is a day commemorated on the third Sunday of November each year to remember the many millions who are killed and injured on the world's roads, together with their families, friends, and many others who are also affected by road accidents. Further knows that the World Day of Remembrance for Road Traffic Victims is also a day on which we thank the emergency services and reflect on the tremendous burden and cost of this daily continuing disaster to families communities and countries, and on ways to hold the carnage in our roads, and take this opportunity to remember and pay homage to the millions of our people who were killed in road accidents, and those who were injured together with their families, friends, and many others who are also affected by road accidents. I so move, Honorable Deputy Chair. Thank you, that deals with notices of motion. We are now going to have motions without notice, and we will start with the Honorable Bosov. Thank you very much, Dear Speaker. On behalf of the Democratic Alliance, I hereby move without notice that this council notes with concern that despite the short-lived relief of rainfall experienced over the past weekend, the dam level for the town of Leidenburg and surrounding areas under the jurisdiction of Tapacheo Municipality is still a major concern and that water is declining rapidly. The Leidenberg Dam has a surface area of about 317,000 um, square, two square, and if the water level drops by a mere meter, approximately 317,000 liters of water is lost. Further notes that even though Tabacheo Municipality officials are tasks, tasked with the day-to-day -day operations of service delivery, as well as provide a contingent plan to residents to ensure they are aware of the dire situation, the municipality has no alternate plan of action in place to address this matter, which could see many residents sitting high and dry, and acknowledges that only under a DA government will all necessary steps have been taken and residents would have been informed of restrictions to ensure that no one is left without water. I so move. Honorable members, is there any objection to that motion? If none, the motion is carried then. We are going to the next uh, motion, Honorable Goya. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Chair. On behalf of the African National Congress, I hereby move without, no without notice <clears throat> that the Council notes and debates Africa Industrialization Day, which takes place on the 20th of November, in terms of the United Nations General Assembly Proclamation and Resolution 44237 of 22 December 1989. Further notes that Africa Industrialization Day is intended to mobilize commitment of the international community to the industrialization of Africa, and also serves as a reminder that more than 30 of the world's 48 least developed countries are located in Africa, and acknowledges that Africa's economic emergence 
and transition from a continent of low income into middle income economies requires transforming the economic structure from predominantly agrarian and extractive activities to a more vibrant and value-adding industrial sectors like processing and manufacturing. I so move. Is there any objections to the motion? If none, the motion is agreed to in terms of section 65, 65 of the constitution. We are going to Honorable Lauskahne. On behalf of the Democratic Alliance, I hereby move without notice that this council takes serious note of our changing global clim climate and change and the urgent need for countries across the world to contribute towards the preservation of our natural resources where possible. Further note that natural resources such as water is a critical source of life for humanity and nature. And lastly, resolve that water as a basic need must be protected and managed as a priority on all spheres of government in South Africa. I so move. Is there any objection to the motion? If none, the motion is agreed to in terms of section 65 of the Constitution. We will now allow the Honorable Lihi. EFF. <laughs> Number two, any objection to the motion? Any objection to the motion? If none, the motion is then agreed to in terms of section 65 of the Constitution. Honorable Bratisse. Thank you, Chair. Deputy Chair, on behalf of the Democratic Alliance, I hereby move without notice that this council <clears throat> notes with concern that the cash-trapped South African Airways is considering cutting up to a fifth of its workforce. These job cuts of nearly 1,000 employees will add to the already high unemployment rate. SAA says it's necessary to retrench workers to ensure that they remain committed to offer its customers the best service and that they regret that they will have to part ways with some of their loyal colleagues. Further notes that according to the president of the National Transport Movement Union, Mashudu Rapeta, the union was not consulted on this plan and that the retrenchment of these employees is the, is the direct result of increased salaries of pilots. And lastly, this council recognizes that if SAA was privatized when the DA originally called for it to be sold, these retrenchments could have been avoided and less South Africans would have been unemployed. I so move. Members, is there any objection to the motion? Yeah. In light of the objection, the motion may not be proceeded with, but the motion without notice will now become notice of a motion. But it's not, it's the, the, no, the motion are not proceeded with. Is it what we are saying? Table? Yes. Then we will go to the Honorable Mulitsane. Uh, thank you, Deputy Chair. I rise on behalf of EFF, noting that uh, from the 25th of November to 16 December, it will be the 16 days of, act of activism against gender-based violence. The violence of women and children takes place almost every day. I rise here to say that uh, we must participate during the 16 days of activism in support of all the victims. I so move. Thank you, let us, just for correction, it is the 25 to the 10th to the of 10th. December, just to correct that, for the correctness of the motion. Any objection to the motion? If none, the motion is agreed to in terms of section 65. We will now do, go to the Honorable Bibi.
Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Deputy Chair. I hereby move without notice on behalf of the African National Congress that the Council, one, note that a tornado ripped through Hanover, Peter Marutzberg, on Tuesday afternoon, injuring scores of people, damaging homes and public infrastructure. Two, also note that a number of homes have collapsed, countless trees have been uprooted, and the electricity supply in the area has been interrupted without a number of possible uh, missing and also two persons declared dead. Three, further note that COCTA in KZN has activated disaster management teams, counselors and volunteers, and, and also NGOs, gift of the givers, to assist the affected communities. For therefore, convey our deepest sympathy to the affected people, I so move. Thank you very much. Is there any objection to the motion? If none, the motion is agreed to in terms of section 65 of the Constitution. The next one will be Honorable Dutoy. Thank you, Deputy Chair. On behalf of the Freedom Front Plus, I wish to move without notice that this House notes that of the 3,551 dairy producers who provides milk to South Africans in January, uh, uh, in January 2009, the latest statistic indicate in August 2019 that only 1,228 producers remained. More than 30,000 jobs have been lost in the agricultural sector since January 2018 as a result of the persistent drought. According to the Business Maverick in South Africa, 37.44% of rural communities are affected by the drought and with an 80% loss of the total game numbers. In the past six years, the wildlife sector have felt major hits within the subsectors of hunting and tourism. The droogte in talle provincies maakt het by die dag moeiliker om te boer. Ons boere sikkel om te oorleef en het dringend uitkomst nodig. Volgens die minister is aan die fondse beskikbaar hiervoor nie en moet die boere versekering uitneem. Ons as een land kan wel iets doen. Ons kan bid en ons boere in ons gebede opdra en as een parlement praktische oplossings vind om voedsel en werkssekerheid te verseker door toe te sien dat die nodige holbronne aan die boere beskikbaar gestel word. I move that at the next normal council sitting of the NCOP, the House opens debate on finding solutions to assist all farming communities and their workers in order to avoid an approaching disaster, which will not only have severe impact on the farmers and their workers, but on every South African. I so move. We will take that straight to as a notice of motion, because in terms of the content, it sounds like a, a notice of motion. So let us put it in the order paper on next. Nongeni. Thank you, Deputy Chair. I hereby move without notice on behalf of the African National Congress that the Council know that the renowned South African writer, activist, and poet Sandile Digeni passed away on Saturday, 9th November. Also note that Digeni was born in Victoria West Northern Cape in 1966 and was a student at UWUC and Pentec, where he obtained a diploma in journalism. Further note that Digen was editor of Arts for the Cape Times, editor of the Day Said African, and political editor of This Day South Africa, but also served as a stint as a postperson for South African Housing Minister Lindy Wessesul. He also had an extensive career in the arts, having published the poetry collection Guava Juice and Telegraph to the Sky, as well as Anthropology of the Newspaper Article and Essay. Therefore, send our deepest condolences to his family and the friends. I so moved. Thank you. Just for correctness of the motion, he was a student at Pen Peninsula Technicon. Skira uh, Ilanza Technicon. Just for the correctness of the motion, is there any objection to the motion? No objection, the motion is agreed in terms of section 65. Members, I'm really trying to assist everyone, so I don't want new hands now. Honorable Mola. Thank you, Deputy Chairperson. On behalf of the African National Congress, 
I move that without notice that the council note that the president of the republic officially opened the Mpumalanga High Court on Friday, 8 November, following <laughs> the commencement of its function in May this year. Number two, also note that this is a milestone towards enhancing access to justice and will provide relief to Mpumalanga residents who will no longer require to take long trips to the Pretoria High Court for all serious criminal offenses and civil claims. Three, further note that the court which cost the state 1.4 billion is a four-story building with 12 courtrooms for civil and criminal cases. Five, therefore congratulate the ANC-led government for ensuring that it continues on its historical task of bringing justice closer to the people I so move. Thank you, Honorable Member. Is there any objection to the motion? <laughs> the <laughs> <laughs> the <laughs> in, in light of the objection, the motion may not be proceeded with. We will now go to the Honorable Mfaya. Honorable Deputy Chairperson, as IFP, I hear, my, I hear by move without notice that the House notes that the Lily of the Village Children's Village in Ilanga Township, Peter Marusberg, Mkungundov, who offends, is struggling for enough resources in terms of funds and ARVs to treat all the HIV positive infected children. Uh, to acknowledge is that admission rates of children to this village remains high and out of the village's capacity to meet demands. Calls for the provincial health department to intervene and ultimately support the village with sufficient funds and resources to meet the needs of, the, all, uh, of HIV positive children. Encourages all South Africans to consider lending a helping hand through donations of food, money, clothes, toys, and community service for this village, I so move. Thank you very much. Is there any objection to the motion? If none, the motion is agreed to in terms of section 65 of the constitution. We will now give the Honorable Mutsamai. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Chairperson. I move on behalf of Economic Emancipation EFF <laughs> uh, to, to, to write the motion to the Minister of Defense and Military Veteran, Nozifiwe Ngakula, about the military veterans. We are now approaching festive season, and those forces, those military veterans, have children, dependency, and they are now, work, they are not working. Some of them are sick, sleep without food, there is nothing for them to eat. Because there is no SRD. There was a benefit, one of their benefits, which was SRD. There's nothing that they are getting now. I would like the minister to tell me what they are going to do with the military veterans. I thank you. I don't know, is it a, is it a motion without notice? But let's accept it. Is there any objection to the motion? If none, that it's not a motion, really. It's not a motion. I understand. There is objection, so the motion may not be proceeded with. Honorable Modise. Thank you, Deputy Chair. On behalf of African National Congress, I move uh, without notice that the council know that the senior managers of the world Renew Kruger National Park has been suspended following the completion of a proof into allegation of racism and torture of black people. Also know that the Sana Park hire analytical investigation services to prove the matter that after the black rangers began speaking out of their suffering in the hands of their white colleagues. I also know that <coughs> Also know that in some the statement made to AFIS 
The Rangers painted the grand group picture that how they were assaulted in the attempted to force them to confess to the crime that they didn't commit. I therefore call on the Sana Park to finalize the disciplinary process against these that have been charged, uh, uh, those who have been charged and make sure that the justice has, is saved. I so moved. I'm also not sure about that one. Is there any objection to the motion? In the light of the objection? In light of the object, objection, we will not uh, con uh, proceed with the motion. There will be ways to deal with that specific issue. Honorable Smith. 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 Thank you, Geachte Adjank Voorzitter. Um, on behalf of the Democratic Alliance, I hereby move without notice that this council notes the water crisis in most municipalities and more, speci more especially in the largest towns and the provincial capital of Limpopo. Further note that some towns like Mokopani, Polokwani and Zanin are upon their various uh, day zeros and no concrete emergency plans in place to deal with such day zero. Uh, various local municipalities are failing to implement and enforce water restrictions and in turn are failing to prevent a day zero scenario. And that this council call on the select committee for cooperative governance and traditional affairs, human settlement, uh, settlements and water and sanitation to in investigate the state of this crisis as well as action plans to deal with any day zero as a matter of agency, I so move. There is, there is objection, so the motion will not be proceeded to, it's fine. Honorable Lutuli. We are, we, are, we are getting closer to the end, so please, Honorable Lutuli. Honorable members, order in this house. Order in this honorable house. You want to be called honorable landsman? It cannot be that you really point to another member like that. It cannot be. Honorable Lutuli. Thank you, Chair. I rise on behalf of the EFF that the council note that the Ministry of Police in its collective wisdom has failed to uphold its oath of office in the matter of relating the matter of Senzo Menu. Acknowledge that it has undermined the authority of our country and its credibility. Note that these are signs of incapacity and gross negligence which led to unbecoming acts in the investigation on, of, of the death of Senzo Menu. Also note that this has allowed opportunities such as Afroforum to seek legitimacy from our people and hence parade themselves as advocates of justice. I move that the department must immediately fire all officers involved in this gross misconduct. That the state intervene through appointing the capacitated team to rework the case of, of Senzo Meiwa and finalize it with reasonable time. I so move. Is there any objection? There is no objection. I didn't hear an objection. Mama Rehane. Is there an objection? If there is an objection, the motion cannot be proceeded with. Uh, miscommunication from your side. You only looked in front of you. I even had my hand up. I objected. There was an objection. Why must you make an issue out of it? There was an objection. Mama Rehane. Thanks, Chairperson. On behalf of the ANC, I hereby, I hereby move without notice that the Council knows with an utmost appreciation and recognition the recognition that continued rise to the fame and global recognition of our national music maestro and superstar Maya Christina Shibao Wajrif, who is also known as Shoma Jose. Yes. Further note that Shoma Josie, who was born in Shelly Village in Limpopo, is the daughter of Rosemary Paweni and Mark 
World Reef, who ran a non-governmental organization which was made to assist people with their land claims, is now regarded as one of the best performers in Africa. And her latest song, named at and inspired by professional wrestler, actor, and television presenter, John Trina. John Cena, yes, has earned her global recognition and, take, <laughs> and takes this opportunity to honor and recognize Shoma Josie and her continued rise to fame around the world. I so move. I take it there is no objection to that one. Honorable Jadu, you will be the last one. <laughs> Good to be the last. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Deputy Chair. Uh, motion without notice. I hereby move without notice on behalf of the African National Congress that the council notes that Honorable Matikizela withdrew from the race of becoming interim party leader of the DA after being instructed to do so by the liberal faction of the, of the DA in fear of splitting the votes meant for the Honorable Stian Hazen. Also note that the classical liberal faction has promised Matikizela their support in the 2020 election conference in return for his withdrawal from the election this weekend in support of Honorable Stian Hazen. Further note that this all happened following the election of Helen Zill as the federal chairperson and the resignation of my mind as the party leader. I so move. <laughs> Is there any objection to the motion? <laughs> You can, you can object from your seat. <laughs> Honorable members, <clears throat> there is no motion. And we are not going to call for further motions. We just made an exception today. Usually we have just 20 minutes, but really, from, from the day that I started here, there was no time for motions. So that's why today we made that exception. It is only for today. Are you satisfied, Honorable Mikalakas? <laughs> Deputy Chairperson, yes, the day is still early, but I see the rule book that I sent you worked. Thank you. Can the Secretary please read the first order of the day? Consideration of report of Select Committee on Finance. 2019 revised fiscal framework. We will now follow the speaker's list and we will call on the Honorable Karim to table the report. Honorable members, the report is on the ATC. Uh, thanks for saying that, Deputy Chairperson, because uh, I was going to draw the attention of members uh, to exactly that. It's in the ATC. I'm tempted to say, therefore, Chairperson, there's nothing for me to say. Uh, everybody obviously read the ATC. They memorized it. They can regurgitate it. So what's the point of me saying anything? But of course, the norm is that I should speak. So I will, because that's the rule. So firstly, I want to say that it's in the ATC, as the Chairperson said. Comrades and friends, and uh, I will just cover the key points in it. So uh, the first thing I want to say uh, is that uh, I think, Minister, we welcome the candor, the openness, the frankness uh, of your input. And we're very grateful for that because many ministers of finance in a similar situation in other countries would seek to gloss over the contradictions and the challenges. They'd seek to spin, and you don't. So I think that's most welcome, and I think uh, it's not just the opposition parties for their own purposes who, who eulogize you for that. So I think do we, or at least most of us in the majority party. But secondly, we think that, um, that we understand fully that it's in the February budgets, annual budgets, that the ministers of finance set out in detail 
the tax, the expenditure, uh, the projections for the next three years, and so on and so on. Uh, and the medium-term budget policy statement is just a broad framework. And we think you're right, Minister, to draw attention to the confusion in the public mind, understandably, and even among some of us as MPs, about the relationship with the medium-term budget policy statement and the budget. And we think it's correct, and we don't have to think it's correct, it's your right as a minister to say that we need to possibly review the relationship between the MTBPS and the budget. What's wrong with that? We've had it since 1997, we're one of the part finders globally of this idea of a medium term budget policy statement, and the minister is certainly within his rights to say, shouldn't we review it? But I think what we should be careful about is seeking in some or other way, not that the minister is doing this necessarily, but he'll speak for himself in whatever forum uh, he, he, he finds it appropriate to. It's not appropriate to, in my view, and the view of the majority in the parliament, not just the two committees, that we dispense with the medium-term budget policy statement. It's crucially important, not least for the very markets that the minister, the government, and parliament are seeking to secure confidence of. We need to have some sort of sense of where the budget's likely to go. Not least because Parliament would otherwise not be able to effectively and rigorously exercise its oversight. So, yes, let's have a debate about the MTBPS and its relationship to the budget. Yes, yes also, let's, let's in fact communicate to the public exactly what this relationship is. But insofar as anybody is suggesting, let's forego it and it has no value and so on, I think, that is not something, I can't speak for the whole parliament, Chairperson, but I would imagine the parliament itself would be loath to dispense it. Not least because not less than a year ago, over a one and a half year period, we reviewed the Money uh, Builds and Related Matters Act, and no one, but no one in civil society or in this parliament raised that issue. Um, Secondly, I, I think it's correct. The minister is in a very invidious position that you have to carry with you a wide range of stakeholders and secure some degree of consensus on where we go. And it's more difficult this time around with an empty BPS than any other minister I think has faced. So when people demanded more concrete information, even with an empty BPS, and they're right, this, this empty BPS in my view, certainly since the ones I've looked at carefully, and I'm sure Chairperson Dick Lady Mashlangu has, because we're in this for our sins roles as chairs and so on of these committees, uh, 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 you know, we've been looking at these carefully, and it's true to say that this empty BPS provides less concrete uh, uh, detail than other empty BPSs. But I don't know what you level it at the minister alone. He has to carry his fellow ministers and uh, civil society actors, political parties out there, the unions and so on, uh, with him. And I think that might have hindered him from going further. So yes, we accept it, the opposition parties have raised it, but uh, that's not going as far as other empty BPS, BPSs have, but there are specific circumstances for that. And it's better to get consensus than shoot ahead and then find you don't have support uh, for your proposals. Now, I want to draw attention, Minister, to a few things. The one that, let me now say something that will please your heart and your mind. This is straight up your street. And this came up, Minister, before you emerged as our Minister. So we're more on the same page sometimes than you might think we are. It's to do with Professor Yanni Rousseau. He's done a lot of work, if it's Professor, about the amount of money we will save if as Ministers, Deputy Ministers, MECs, uh, chairpersons of houses and deputy chairpersons and speakers and whatever, ex-co members, if we bought cars manufactured, well, even if they assembled here in South Africa, and how much of money goes back in the economy, straight up your street, he does it scientifically. It's not like driven by some ideological view. Well, there's ideology underpinning it, but, you know. And we've written, and chairperson, I really want to draw this to your attention because this is setting a very bad precedent. We discussed it last week. Now, I'm struggling to find this thing. Uh, we were looking at it only yesterday. Ah, here we are. Let me literally read this, Minister, because this is straight up your street, I'm sure. In a previous fiscal framework report, it was noted, and we quote from a previous report, the committee expresses its serious concern that although the committee chairperson wrote to the presidency on 15 November 2018, 
regarding the fiscal cliff study group's proposal that members of the executive and government officials buy cars manufactured in South Africa for official use, and following up on this, including with the president's parliamentary councillor about 10 days before the budget, there has been no reply, close quotes. The committee, this is last week, Minister Chairperson, the committee expresses its criticism of the presidency for its failure to reply and request the committee chair to insist on a response from the presidency as soon as possible. It was agreed, but they, because of the legacy issue, it's only fair that myself, although I'm not chairing the SCOF committee now, but it's my responsibility as a chair at that time. So I spoke to the parliamentary councillor yesterday and I spoke to him today. I didn't just write. I spoke to the parliamentary councillor now over three years at least six times. I have spoken to senior officials in the presidency. I have lobbied your colleagues, ministers, to say, why don't we buy Fortuna, for example, Toyota, you know, and so on and so on. And the, the ministers I speak to, obviously I knew which ministers to go to would be empathetic. They said, yes, you are right, it has been raised and so on. So minister, I don't know what's in the ministerial handbook, nor do we. If it's not there, something should be discussed about this. In any case, parliament is entitled to an answer from the presidency. And if we don't get that answer, Chairperson, we need to engage with you and the speaker, that then we'll have to call the president to answer directly because the staff are not replying. Or Mr. Dussault should go to court. The presidency refused to reply to parliament. So I really think this is an unprecedented uh, issue and we need the powers that be in our house and the house on the other side to actually make a decision on this. We need a reply. This is parliament. The president is not above parliament. I have no doubt I can surmise what his views are on this matter. I think he'll be very empathetic, and I'm sure he's not even aware of the point. But uh, the next time I bump into him, I'm going to raise it directly with him, because I think Parliament shouldn't be treated like this. It's three years now almost since we first contacted the presidency on that issue. Then on the pensioners, we are not populists, but they came here, Chairperson, from Simpson, Ducey, Peter, Maris, and I didn't mobilize them. They came here for three years in a row now, right? And they came and they presented the case in EC Zulu. Chairperson, we've been raising this about simultaneous translation. Let's discuss it offline. But the fact is they're saying they need a national minimum wage. We say, of course, morally, even the minister, we have to say even the minister because, you know, it's hard on money. We say, I'm sure even the minister empathizes, right? But, hey, we can't take it to a national minimum wage overnight. In any case, it's a trade-off. It was translated into Zulu, right? So they knew full well what we are saying. And we said to them, look, the very issues that the trade-off for our national health insurance affects you the most as pensioners and the poor. If you talk about free education, basic education onwards, it affects you. If you talk about wealth, welfare grants, it has to be balanced against all of that. But what I'm saying, Minister, is we are not populists. We largely empathize with where you are. We think, though, that the answers to the problems, even we agree across the is not only the answers that National Treasury provides. And we're still stuck with the National Treasury that thinks it and only it has all and every answer. That's not the approach. There are uh, s options that we can have, and like never before, Chairperson, we must depoliticize the budget now. We are in a crisis situation, right? And we should really forget some of our party politics, really. We need to work together, whatever our differences, our country. We need to work with civil society, with the private sector, with the trade unions, and we need to move fast on this. We need the same goodwill we had immediately after Mandela became president and that 1994-1996. And Chairperson, you and the, and the House Chair, you have a crucial role to play in this regard. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. That concludes the debate. I shall now put the question. And the question is that the report be agreed to, but in accordance with Rule 7, 71, we will now allow provinces the opportunity to make their declarations of vote if those who wish. Uh, 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 whatever Mr. Ryder says now attacking me, I need you to know that he said right now you're clapping in agreement with everything I said. <laughs> Any declaration of, uh, let's, let's go to, yes, uh, can, we, can we go provincial? Yeah, Western Province is, all, is Western Province, so that's okay, Honorable Labaskarna. Do we start at the back of the alphabet now? 
Deputy Honourable, you will be surprised, there will be ones after I've done. Honourable Deputy Chair, the Flimsy 21 uh, page report represents hours of work by the Committee of the National Assembly and the NCOP, but also of many other institutions and individuals who took the time to engage critically and constructively with the contents of the Finance Minister's medium term budget policy statement. Honourable Je Deputy Chair, these institutions and members of the public are to be appreciated by us as members of Parliament as they represent the people who elected us to be here to speak on their behalf. Admittedly, Chair, some of the inputs were from narrow interest groups and addressed only specific issues. However, there are issues which need to be highlighted and which should indeed be brought to our attention as legislators. Because that is our role, Deputy Chair, to critically evaluate the proposals of the executive, to interrogate them through the eyes of our people and to ensure that this parliament passes laws that are fair and just. The pleas of the pensioners to consider the needs, the cries of the tobacco industry to make level playing fields uh, where laws are equally applied, the saber rattling of Kusatu and their members feel the pressure of narrowing fiscus, the harsh realities of the Fiscal Cliff Study Group, the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants and the Budget Justice Coalition, the warnings from OTA and Woman and the innovations of shot spotters. All of this fit into the picture that we were presented with. And yet the FFC, a constitutional mandated entity who gave the input to the committee, had to describe to, to them the supreme arrogance of, the, of Treasury, the disdain with which inputs are treated. While we appreciate the presence of the Minister today, his absence yesterday when he was in, required to be here to uh, answer questions is perhaps a confirmation of the arrogance of Treasury. Honourable Deputy Chair, the current fiscal climate is bleak. This is no time for business as usual. Treasury's arrogance has brought us here. They are instructed in Section 216 of the Constitution to exercise control over the country's finances. They have failed. They must now submit themselves to this House and begin to account. The Minister needs Sorry, to yield to our oversight. Sorry, Honourable Lavaskagni, there is a point of order. Just a moment. Yes, Honourable Chief Whip. On a statement that is misleading the House by Honourable Lavaskagni, that the Deputy Minister, the minister absented himself yesterday, whereas in our consultation, there's agreement to defer the questions to the Minister of Finance for the set date as agreed by the House. This is incorrect to mislead the House. Honourable it members. It's misleading. Honourable members, I, I want, because I was, I was presiding over this House yesterday, and we accepted the apology from the Minister with the deference of the questions to the next sitting on the 27th of November. We had accepted it. No, so I don't want a debate on this one. I'm just saying, you may continue. The minister needs to heal to our oversight and begin to act like he is part of the solution. Take charge, minister. ESCOM needs a CEO. Minister Gordon missed his deadline. SAA needs an effective plan. Local government needs reinvention. And Kusato needs to come on board. You hold the key. The report is accepted, and the committee administration is congratulated on a difficult task. Well done. We shall now proceed to the manual voting on the question. This shall be done in alphabetical order per province. And we now call upon the provinces, commencing with Eastern Cape. Eastern Cape support the report. Free State. Uh, thank you, Deputy Chair. The Free State support the report. Gauteng. KwaZulu Natal. KwaZulu Natal, here is a report. Bobo supports. Pumalanga. Pumalanga, say a vum. Kapa Bukoni. Ria Dumela Nalioneta. Northwest. Support. Western Cape. Understand. If all the heads of delegation voted, 
If so, voting will now close. All provinces were in favor, so we therefore declare the report agreed to in terms of section 65 of the Constitution. The Secretary will read the second order of the day. Construction of report of the Committee on Trade and Industry, Econ Economic Development, Small Business Development, Tourism, Employment and Labor, Econ Economic Partnership Agreement between South Africa, Customs Union, and Mozambique, and the United Kingdom. We will now proceed to the speaker's list, and we will now call on the Honorable Musi Manehape Muimang to table the report. Honorable members, allow me to express my gratitude uh, to allow me to table this uh, report uh, from the select committee. Indeed, the select committee received a briefing from uh, the Department of Trade and Industry on the economic partnership agreement between South Af Southern African Custom Union and Mozambique and the United Kingdom on the 4th of November 2019 with the intention to recommend for ratification by parliament. The members uh, were made aware of the conclusion of the talks involving governments of United Kingdom and South Africa. Indeed, these talks sought agreement on terms, of, on terms that would apply for our trade relation should the UK leave the European Union without an appropriate withdrawal agreement. The importance of this agreement cannot be overemphasized. In 2018, bilateral trade between our countries was worth 142 billion. The United Kingdom is our fourth largest market for export behind only China, Germany, and United States. And it is the seventh largest supplier of imported goods. Honorable Chair, it is estimated that our exports to the United Kingdom supports 56,500 direct jobs and a further 117,500 indirect jobs, bringing the total number of jobs supported by exports to the UK to nearly 175,000. Honorable Deputy Chair, how is the current trade facilitate between UK and South Africa? As with all members of the European Union, trade with the UK has to date been facilitated under what is known as SADC EU Economic Partnership Agreement or EPA. The EPA or Economic Partnership Agreement provides for the tariff arrangements applicable to trade between six SADC countries and any of the 28 European Union member states. The SADC countries are South Africa, Botswana, Lesotho, Namibia, Eswatini, and Mozambique. A number of products are duty-free, and there are detailed trade rules set out in the Economic Partnership Agreement to make trade relations easier between ourselves. Why do we need a new Economic Partnership Agreement between South Africa and UK? Honorable members will know that following a referendum held in the United Kingdom in 2016, the UK has notified the EU of its intention to leave the European Union by 31st October this year. The date has now been extended to the 31st January 2020. If there is no agreement on the terms of the departure, it will be in the form of a no-deal exit. This will have a material impact on six SACOM countries, including South Africa, which trade with the UK under the terms of the existing SADC European Union Economic Partnership Agreement. All trade will then fall under standard World Trade Organization rules, which means that the normal import tariffs would apply and many of our products will lose duty-free status. For South Africa and indeed for the SACOM countries, reverting to trade on World Trade Organization terms 
would incur significant cost. In March this year, the United Kingdom published an interim regime in the event of it leaving the European Union Customs Union and in the absence of a replacement to the SADC European Union Economic Partnership Agreement. If this were to occur, South Africa would lose preferential access to the UK market on 114 products, affecting exports around 7 billion rand. This affects, among others, vehicles, auto components, wine, textiles, and clothing, sugar, fish, and machinery. In some cases, this may lead to a loss of exports completely, which would be significant for a number of provinces. In addition, United Kingdom exports to SACUM countries would be subject to higher tariffs, which may also increase the cost of these products in South Africa. And if they are in input costs into South Africa made products, it will hurt local industries. What has been the process to establish a new economic partnership agreement between South Africa and United Kingdom? To avoid the disruption to South Africa's exports and that of the region, the SACUM countries engaged with the UK over a roughly two-year period. An expedited process for the negotiations saw significant ground covered in addressing issues and the final terms were concluded by SACUM countries in Khaboron. What measures are contained in the new economic partnership agreement between South Africa and United Kingdom? The new agreement will be known as SACUM United Kingdom Economic Partnership Agreement and will effectively roll over and replicate the terms of trade present in the existing SADC European Union Economic Partnership Agreement. It will allow for seamless and interrupted trade to continue between ourselves and the United Kingdom. The new agreement includes the details as follows. The quota levels for certain products of duty-free trade, health and safety standards for agricultural products, the rules to determine whether a particular good qualifies as locally made and are therefore eligible for preferential trade rates, and whether goods which have been processed partially in an EU state can still qualify under the rules of origin. This is called cumulation. Honorable Deputy Chairperson, it has also been agreed to what is called a built-in agenda, which is a list of matters that further negotiations will be conducted on after the agreement comes into effect. This includes issues such as the right of countries to use export taxes to promote local industries, crediting South African made inputs in products made in other circum countries when we export this to Britain in future. The new economic partnership agreement will come into effect in the event that the UK leaves the European Union on the 31st January 2020 and will govern bilateral agreement between the six SACUM countries on the side and the United Kingdom on the other. This is an important agreement to provide certainty and predictability for exporters. It will ensure that in the event of a no deal Brexit, trade between the United Kingdom and South Africa will continue on the same terms. This means that South African business, which use South Africa as an export base to the United Kingdom, can begin to plan, knowing that their preferential access will be protected. It means that those investors which are holding back on capital commitments until they receive certainty can begin to invest again. And it means that the thousands of workers from across this country whose jobs are supported by trade with the United Kingdom can feel confident that this government, this ANC-led government is working for them. Honorable Deputy Chairperson, 
the select committee, after due consideration of the briefing, decided to recommend it to, to recommend to the National Council of Province plenary for the ratification of the economic partnership agreement between Southern African Custom Union and Mozambique and the United Kingdom. I thank you. It concludes the debate. I shall now put the question, and the question is that the report be agreed to, and in accordance with Rule 71, we will now allow provinces the opportunity to make the declarations of vote if they so wish. None, then we can call upon the provinces to proceed with the voting on the question. Eastern Cape? Eastern Cape support the report. Free State? Free State supports the report, Honorable Chair. Gauteng? Gauteng supports the report, Honorable Chair. Wazulu Natal? Wazulu Natal, Limpopo? Give them, allow them to, to print for you. Allow them to press for you, yes. Speak, Mama Rehan. Limpopo support the, the report. Thank you. Mpumalanga. Mpumalanga stands up. North Cup. Cups on our skin. Northwest. Northwest support. Western Cape. The Western Cape supports. Have all the heads of delegations voted? If so, voting have closed, and since all provinces have agreed, I therefore declare the report agreed to in terms of section 65 of the Constitution. We will now request the Secretary to call the next order of the day, a third order. Consideration of report of Select Committee on Security and Justice, declaration of amnesty in terms of section 139, subsection 2A, of the Firearms Control Act 2000. We will now go according to the speaker's list and we will call on the Honorable Sheikh to table the report. Honorable, Honorable Deputy Chairperson, um, the control of firearms has been a contentious issue in South Africa and with the inception of the Firearms Control Act 2000 in 2003, it promised an effective way of firearm control administered by the South African Police Services. The Central Firearm Register was established to process and monitor firearm ownership through applications and renewals. Section 1391 of the Firearms Control Act provides that the Minister of Police may by notice in the Gazette, declare an amnesty if the amnesty may result in the reduction of the number of illegally possessed firearms in South Africa, and it, and it is in the interest of the public to do so. Section 1392 of the Act also provides that such amnesty will only be valid if it is approved by Parliament. In terms of Section 138 of the Firearms Control Act, amnesty means an ind indemnity against prosecution for the unlawful possession of a firearm and ammunition. The firearms amnesty is an important process as it has the potential to decrease the number of illegal firearms in South Africa, particularly in light of our fight against crime and our objective of halving crime by 2030. This amnesty process is important. However, in order to effectively receive the firearms and to ensure a successful amnesty, the select committee had to ensure that SAFs was ready in respect of their planning, implementation, and particularly in ensuring that provincial police stations have received adequate training. The select committee met on the 11th of September 2019 <coughs> and received a briefing from the South African Police Services on the amnesty. The select committee raised a number of concerns related to the safekeeping of surrendered firearms and ammunition, police procedure to destroy surrendered firearms and ammunition, as well as concerns with the process for citizens in legal possession of licenses that expired. The committee therefore required the assurances from SAPS that the conditions which affects the success of an amnesty were, were indeed complied with and that public trust was restored in SAPS. Deputy Chair, SAPS was required to respond to the select committee on the matters raised and 
on the meeting of the Select Committee on the 30th of October 2019, a further briefing from SAFS on the outstanding matters was received. The committee noted with concern the infrastructural challenges faced by SAFS in respect of their Central Firearms Registry, and the committee re requested that SAFS addresses this challenge as expeditiously, expeditiously as possible. The committee further reiterated that SAFS should ensure that all provinces are suitably trained and that the designated firearms officers are vetted accordingly. The committee, however, recognizes the importance of the recovery of illegal firearms and the potential impact it may have on the reduction of violence and crime in South Africa. The committee was therefore pleased to note that during the 2010 amnesty, which ran for a period of three months, SAPS reported that it had received a total of 11,887 illegal firearms and a total of 139,234 rounds of ammunition. We therefore recognize that the amnesty will play an important role in the recovery and destruction of illegal firearms and that other measures undertaken by SAPS, such as roadblocks, searches and raids, will assist in reducing violence and fighting crime in South Africa. Deputy Chairperson, the Select Committee, after satisfying itself on the readiness of SAPS for the amnesty, and after due consideration, approved the Minister's request for, for an amnesty period from the 1st of December 2019 to the 31st of May 2020, and recommends that the National Council of Province adopts the report and approves the amnesty. The committee also requested the Minister of Police consider declaring a separate process for the renewal of expired licenses that should run concurrently to the amnesty period. I thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate. I shall now put the question. The question is that the report be agreed to. In accordance with the Rule 71, I shall first allow provinces the opportunity to make the declarations of vote if they so wish. Yes, Honorable Labuskagne. Thank you, Deputy Chair. Honorable Deputy Chair, the Western Cape Province will, as the only government with a clear project to combat crime actively and decisively, of course support any initiative that will bring down crime. However, there is no proof put before the committee that firearms amnesty assists in this regard. Even after it was asked, we believe the contrary to be true in recent years. Furthermore, South African Police Services doesn't have basic data readily available on firearms in their positions in their possession. They make no provision for the separation of renewal fire, f firearms from weapons to be destroyed and 46 stations will be excluded from this process. But the names of these aren't yet publicly known. SAPS is under the illusion that trust between them and the public has been restored and it cannot be absolutely guaranteed that these weapons will not, like in the past, end up in criminal hands. There are also serious concerns about the training of SAPS to be able to enforce this amnesty effectively and correctly. What is more, in a recent reply to Parliament, it was acknowledged that SAPS lost 500 of its own service weapons. They also lost 9 million 9 millimeter rounds of their own ammunition. If they can't even look after their own weapons, how will they be able to ensure that these weapons handed in, of which we have no guarantee about available storage space either, will not also disappear? This is over and above the fact that the actual criminals are usually not inclined to just hands in their firearms. Chairperson, the purpose of firearms and epsty should be reduced crime if it is in the public interest to do so. If the SAPs cannot guarantee its success, and we believe they absolutely cannot at this stage, then it is certainly not in the, in the public interest. For this reason, the Western Cap cannot support this issue initiative until such time as the department and SAPs can give clarity and guarantees on these matters. The safety of the public comes first. No other declaration. In the absence thereof, we shall now proceed to the voting on the question, and it will be done in alphabetical order per province. Eastern Cape. Eastern Cape, Castle report. Free State. 
Northern Cape supports the report. Northwest. Northwest M Sam. Western Cape. Oppose. With all the heads of delegation, if you have all voted, we are now closing the vote. More of five more than five provinces have agreed. So we therefore declare the report agreed to in terms of section sixty five of the constitution. We will now request the secretary to read the fourth order of the day. Consideration of report of the Committee on Security and Justice, quarterly progress reports of the Magistrate Commission as tabled in terms of section one, section 13, subsection three F of the Magistrate Act 1993. Honorable Sheikh, we will now call on the chairperson of the Select Committee on Security and Justice to table the report. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Chairperson. Uh, Honorable Deputy Chairperson, the Select Committee has received progress reports from the Magistrates Commission for its consideration in the Sixth Parliament. These reports arise from matters related to magistrates who had, who had serious charges of misconduct against them and which had been dealt with by the Select Committee on Security and Justice in the Fifth Parliament. The Select Committee has a statutory obligation and, and is empowered in terms of Section 13 of the Magistrates Act to pass a resolution to either confirm a provisional suspension recommended by the Minister in terms of Section 133C or not to confirm such a suspension in terms of Section 133D of the Magistrates Act of 1993. The Select Committee may also pass a resolution to confirm the withholding of the remuneration of a magistrate who is on suspension in terms of Section 134AB of the Magistrates Act. On the 4th of September 2019, the Select Committee on Security and Justice received a briefing from the Magistrates Commission on the progress of inquiries made against four magistrates. In terms of Section 133F of the Magistrates Act of 1993, the Magistrates Commission must cause a report on the progress made in respect of inquiries against magistrates who have been provisionally suspended from office to be submitted to Parliament every three months. The Magistrates Commission's report reported progress to the committee as follows. Magistrates J.F. van Skalveig, the Chief Magistrate at Kempton Park, the matter was not finalized since 2013. The Magistrates Commission charged Ms. van Skalveig with 18 counts of misconduct. The charges relate to gambling during office hours, borrowing money from subordinates that she failed to repay, making misrepresentations to the Judge President Hao Teng during her stint as an acting judge, in that she handed down judgments which were not written by herself but by magistrates under her control and on, and, and on occasion by an attorney. These judgments were furthermore prepared prior to hearing arguments of counsel. Magistrate von Skalvik had been suspended as a magistrate by the minister on the 4th of June 2013. On the 12th of November 2013, Parliament confirmed Ms. van Skalvik's provisional suspension from office. On the 28th, 23rd of May 2018, the Select Committee confirmed that Ms. Van Skalvik's remuneration should be withheld in terms of Section 134AB of the Magistrates Act, Act 1993. The Magistrates Commission advised the committee that there were various delays with the final, finalization of the matter due to the many court applications submitted by Magistrate Van Skalvik to delay the proceedings. The, magist the Magistrates Commission is working towards a speedy conclusion of this matter. On Magistrate E.S. Nzimande, the Regional Court President in KwaZulu-Natal, a charge sheet dated 31st of August 2018 containing 50 counts of misconduct was served on Mr. Nzimande on the 4th of September 2018. Some of the charges relate to receiving monetary benefits for appointing persons to acting positions in the Regional Council, in the Regional Courts within his Regional Division, as well as charges related to sexual harassment. 
On 27th of February 2019, the Select Committee had confirmed the provisional suspension of Magistrate Nzimande. The Magistrates Commission reported to the Committee that a date for the hearing of Ms. Nzimande's matter will, soon, will, will be finalized soon. On Magistrate L.B. Freeman, the Senior Magistrate at Muscle Bay, a chart sheet dated the 17th of November 2017 containing 24 counts of misconduct was served on Ms. Freeman on 23rd of November 2017. Magistrate Freeman was dishonest in her application for the position which the Commission found out at a later stage. The Magistrates Commission at the time was unable to conduct a proper vetting of Ms. Freeman. The Magistrates Commission advised the committee that the vetting procedure has since been improved. On 23rd of August 2018, the Select Committee confirmed the provisional suspension from the Office of Magistrate Freeman in terms of Section 133B of the Magistrates Act 1993. The Commission advised the Committee that the inquiry is postponed until the 12th of September 2019 for the presiding officer to impose a sanction. On Magistrate M.D. Hinga, the Chief Magistrate in Bloemfontein, the Commission reported that there was an allegation of ra rape against Mr. Hinga. The complaint was submitted to the Department on the 2nd of November 2016 and referred to the Commission for attention. The Magistrate had been charged with serious allegations of misconduct and on the 23rd of May 20, 2018, the Select Committee confirmed his provisional suspension from office in terms of Section 133B of the Magistrates, Magistrates Act 1993. The inquiry is postponed and the committee was advised that the hearing will continue from the 30th of September to the 4th of October 2019. Deputy, Deputy Chairperson, in the committee's interaction with the Magistrates, Magistrates Commission, the committee noted the delays in the hearings of magistrates. The committee also requested the Magistrates Commission to respond to a range of its concerns, including some of the following whether the lower courts had monitoring mechanisms in place to review the performance of magistrates, and whether employee wellness programs were in place. The Select Committee noted with concern that it was shocking that crime is perpetrated by the very people entrusted with holding the office of a magistrate, and encouraged the Magistrates Commission to finalize the hearings as, as expeditiously as possible. Honorable Deputy Chair, the Select Committee on Security and Justice recommends that the National Council of Province adopts the report. I thank you. concludes the debate. I shall now put the question. The question is that the report be agreed to. In accordance with Rule 71, I shall first allow provinces the opportunity to make their declarations of vote if they so wish. We shall now proceed to the voting on the question, and this shall be done in alphabetical order per province. I now call upon the provinces. Eastern Cape. Eastern Cape, I cast a report. Free State. Free State, yes, support the chair. Gauteng. Mawini. Gauteng, yes, Kasa, chairperson. Wazulu Natal. Wazulu Natal, yes, Kasa. Limpopo. Limpopo, yes, support the deputy chairperson. Mpumalanga. Mpumalanga supports the report. Northern Cape. Northern Cape supports the report. Northwest. Northwest support the report, Chair. Western Cape. Western Cape support. All the de heads of delegations have voted and provinces have voted in favor of the report. I therefore declare the report agreed to in terms of Section 65 of the Constitution. The Secretary will read the fifth order of the day. Consideration of report of select committee on petitions, executive undertaking. Hearing of Mdlovo petition held on 17 July 2019 at Parliament and inspection in local to Togoza Hostel and Palm Ridge in Eguruleni Metropolitan Municipality on 23 August 2019, dated 9 October 2019. Thank you. We will now call, according to the speaker's list, the Honorable Z.C. Neta to table the report. Thank you very much, Honorable Deputy Chair. Uh, the petition dealt with the report 
the the petitioner, Mr. Ndovu, Deputy Chairperson, who was claiming uh, his rights of his own mother who passed on of a property which was situated at Tokoza Hostel. The property number, earth number was 8017. And Mr. Ndovi was basing his claim on the conven con convention of certain rights into leasehold or, or ownership act number 81 of 1988. Chairperson, uh, that's the basis of the, this petition and I am hoping that you did receive it from the, uh, the copies of it. They were 80 seats to all of you. I'm sure you understand the, the processes that we have followed, but what is important now is to report to the House how far are we as the committee in terms of dealing with the report itself. Chairperson, we undertook a, 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 a visit to Gauteng after we have called Mr. Ndlovu to present his case to do a local inspection of the place where the property was. And after doing that, Chair, we also invited the Department of Human Settlement and also the Department of uh, Cocta as well as the municipality that is affected. I must indicate, Chair, that the municipality was quite clear to say to us the act that uh, Mr. Ndlovu is, is, is basing his claim from. It doesn't apply in terms of the municipality itself because the municipality is governed by municipal as, uh, MFMA, so which prohibits the municipality from financially compensating the petitioner. And we then engage between ourselves and the municipality and the department uh, with Mr. Ndlovi present. And we made some proposal, Chairperson, because at that time we discovered that Mr. Lovu has already occupied two um, stands within the municipality, ERF 1184 and ERF 1134, which he felt strongly that it would compensate her mother's stand. But unfortunately, the ERFs that he have identified, they were not readily rezoned by the municipality. One was meant for business and the other one was not yet identified what was it going to be used for by the municipality. And the committee uh, discovered that during their negotiations between the municipality and Mr. Ndlovu, there were some co concessions in terms of compensating him without giving him rents and cents. But we said, because this case is quite a very long case, which started since 2004, and us as, 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 as NCOP, we only receive it 2018. In their concession, they are agreeing that they would look at the issue of giving him one of the stands between the two that I have referred to. And we recommended as the committee as followed. The committee concluded that time frame for four months be given within which the municipality should report back to the NCOP on the outcome of settlement negotiations, which I have referred to. They should be done by providing NCOP with a progress report within 120 days of tabling this report to council. In the process leading to the four-month period, 
the municipality is requested to provide the NSOP with a monthly progress report indicating steps the municipality has taken to facilitate and action the proposed settlement negotiation with Mr. Ndlovu Femelt. Progress on engagement with the Department of Human Settlement in terms of the Convention of the ERF and the progress on engagement with the Department of Real Estate on the proposed process for the swap transaction. Municipalities should also provide the committee with time frame within which rezoning the ERF should take place, since it is estimated that entire process of rezoning should take uh, approximately four months to, facilitate, to finalize, sorry. The municipality should provide the committee with up-to-date monthly report on zoning, as I have indicated. Those are the recommendations that the committee has made to the Nlovo family regarding the matter. Thank you, Honorable Thank, Deputy thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> that concludes the debate. We shall now put the question, and the question is that the report be agreed to. In accordance with Rule 71, I shall first allow provinces the opportunity to make the declarations of vote if they so wish. We shall now proceed to the voting on the question, and it shall be done in alphabetical order per province. We will now call upon the provinces, Eastern Cape. Eastern Cape, I support the report. Thank you, Free State. Eh, Mutlasa Mudula Stulo, Free State, Amohela Gadia Tlasepeti. Gauteng supports the report. KwaZulu Natal. KwaZulu Natal, I have said a report is Lalo. I don't know, there are so many mics that are on. Yes, uh, Limpopo. Limpopo support the report. Thank you. Mpumalanga. Pumalanga Northern Cape. Northern Cape supports the report. Northwest. Northwest support the report. Thank you, Western Cape. Eastern Cape supports. Yeah, Voma. All the heads of delegates, delegation have voted, voting is closed. All provinces is in favor, and therefore we declare the report agreed to in terms of section 65 of the Constitution. We will now call the secretary to read the sixth order of the day. Conservation of report of select committee on petitions and executive undertakings. Executive undertakings made by the Minister of Human Settlements during the House sitting of 6 June 2017, dated 9 October 2019. According to the speaker list, we will call now on the Honorable Z. T. Nguita to table the report. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Chair. Must I correct that I'm Z. V. Nguita? Thank you very much, you Chair. Can, you can do it for the record. It's very important. Thank you very much, Chairperson, if that is allowed. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. The committee said on the 5th of September, looking at uh, executive undertakings by the Department of Human Settlement. And again, Chair, I assume that you have looked at the undertakings. I will go straight to the recommendations of the committee. I must first, Chair, indicate that one of the things that we have identified as the department, you as the committee, sorry, is that uh, the Department of Human Settlement now need to set time frame in terms of finalization of their projects. Because uh, one chair, we've noted that they have projects that are incomplete and in terms of their records, you'll pick up that the information that they have is not in line with what we know as people that are residing in those um, provinces. 
Our recommendation, therefore, are as follows. The Commission resolved that Department had to look into time frames, as I have indicated, regarding the outcome of its projects. Two, the committee observed that it, it, it preferable would like the department when they report to the committee, it should be a report that indicate projects and programs that they are doing in line with provinces so that we are able to follow up on the information that they give to the committee. The department had undertaken the task of doing a cost analysis building material. So we're saying uh, the department should make sure that that is happening. And also the committee said that, that there had not been an advocacy campaign to educate people on the availability of government employment hum, uh, housing scheme. So many employees of the department they do not know about that. So we're pleading with the department to popularize such scheme. The committee noted with extreme concern that the issue of title deeds is still a problem within the department and we pleaded to, to, with the minister to deal with the matter uh, urgently. The department to expedite the process of attending to the following uh, projects. The implementation of housing loan human settlement fund to government employees who do not qualify for the RTP that the minister's task team be established to assist provinces and municipality to expedite the process of re-registration of title deed by removing excessive bureaucracy uh, compliances. Those are the recommendations by the committee. I thank you. Committee. Thank, thank, thank you, honorable members. Uh, that concludes the, the business, the, the, the debate. I shall now put the question, the question in that the report be agreed to. In accordance with Rule 71, I shall first allow the province to the opportunity to make their declaration of vote if, if they so wish. There's none. We shall proceed to the voting on the question one. I shall do this in alphabet order uh, per provinces. Eastern Cape? Eastern Cape, Yavuma. The state? Eastern State, Nairobi, Yavuma. Gauteng? Gauteng supports. KwaZulu Natal. KwaZulu Natal, Yavuma. Limpopo. Limpopo, Yavuma. Mpumalanga. Mpumalanga, Yavuma. North and Cape? Um, we have um. Northwest? Northwest, we have um. West and Cape? West and Cape support? Okay. <coughs> Since ever all the provinces uh, have been agreed, now I have all the head of the delegation vote, if so voting, will now close. Um, now we're going to number of the provinces have voted in favor and therefore declaration report agreed to in terms of section 65 of the constitution. Now the secretary will read the seven order of the day. Consideration of report of select committee on petitions and executive undertakings, executive undertakings made by the Minister of Social Development during the House sitting of 7 June 2017, dated 9 October 2019.
that conclude the debate, I shall now put the question. Yes. Honorable mistake. And now I'll call the chairperson, Honorable Nita. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, chairperson, again, the committee said on the 5th of September 2019 uh, with the Minister of Social Development looking at the executive undertakings and again Chair, I'm sure you have gone through them will go straight to the recommendations of the committee. In noting the progress report made by the Minister in relation to the implementation of the executive undertaking under review, the committee makes the following observation and key findings. There were many issues that were hindering success of the graduate social uh, workers graduate program. Some provinces were hiring the social uh, uh, workers after they have graduated and some didn't. Good example is Western Cape is taking those social workers on contract basis. Uh, the second one, the minister, the ministerial committee on social welfare brought critical recommendations that the department would have to implement to strengthen the foster care program, which is very important uh, for those who take care of the kids. The DSD wanted to have a specialized unit that would monitor the success of the program, namely, you only live once, which teaches sexual and, and reproductive rights to children and also to youth uh, in, in, in high schools. And the other one was approval in principle of the idea of creating a social security retirement fund for everyone who is working and a proposal for a comprehensive international framework to ensure not only that no one fell, fell through the crack, but also make sure that there was no double dipping of the benefits. The introduction of the social assistance bill, which is meant to address current backlog in foster care. The bill will create immediate, immediate grant, grant children who stayed with guardians, who qualify for foster care, but could not wait for the long period it took to have a foster care grant executed. The committee concluded that a time frame of three months within which the department should report back on this, uh, on the, to the NCOP on the implementation of pay points infrastructure by providing NCOP with a progress report in this regard because it was one of their undertakings. The department to provide NCOP with with, with Excel provincial figures in relation to the early childhood development grants from 2017-2018 and 2018-2019 and 2019-2020 financial year and the condition for implementation of the grant by the province. All provinces are required are, sorry, are requested to apply and align a uniform approach regarding the employment of social workers. In this regard, the committee recommended engagement between the Department of Education and the province to create uniform in the implementation, retention, condition of services of the social workers. 
the Department of Education and the Department of Social Development are, pro are to provide NCOP with a report indicated, indicating who the custodian of the ECD program. The, should, the report should outline the role and responsibility of both the Department of Basic Education and the Department of Social Development, because out there there's a confusion who is the custodian of such program. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you, Chairperson. <laughs> that concludes the debate. I shall now put the question. The question is that the report be agreed to in accordance with Rule 71. I shall first allow provinces the opportunity to make their declarations of vote if they so wish. That's none. We shall now proceed to the voting on the question. I shall now do, I shall now do this in alphabets in order per provinces. Eastern Cape, Eastern Cape here in Casa, per state, per state support, Gauteng, Gauteng support, KwaZulu Natal, KwaZulu Natal here is Kaslalo, Limpopo, Limpopo support, Umalang, Umalang support, Northern Cape, Northwest. Northwest support. Western Cape. Support. Okay. Uh, now we have all the all the head of the delegation voted. If so, voting will now close the voting. Now uh, the number of the provinces voted in favor. I therefore declare the report agreed to in terms of the section 65 of the constitution. The secretary will read the eight order of the day. Consideration of report of select committee on public enterprises and communication oversight visit to the South African post office Independent Communications Authority of South Africa and Broadband Infrastructure Company. Thank you. Now we are going to call the speaker, T.P. Matibe. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, House Chair. The the, the Select Committee on Public Enterprise and Communication undertook an oversight visit to SAPO, ICASA, as well as uh, BBI, which is Broadband Infrastructure Company, from the 21st to the 25th of October, and wish to report as follows. Following our adoption of the committee's strategic plan, which formed the basis of the committee's annual performance plan where we identified state-owned companies that we wished to visit. We, we then, as a committee, identified the three state-owned entities that we said we're going to visit. Deputy Chair, House Chair, you will recall that uh, uh, the South African Post Office was confronted with quite a number of challenges. Uh, in the past uh, five years, ranging from cash flow shortages, uh, labor disputes, late payments of suppliers, as well as uh, uh, issues relating to senior managers in acting positions. But uh, during our site visit, we, we were refreshed to realize that uh, the post office is moving in the right direction. We visited the, the, the post office, but however, we identified other areas where we think uh, there are still some challenges that we need uh, uh, to look at. So some of the observations that we, we did, honorable members have got the report, uh, we have ATC the report, I won't go through the whole report. Some of the observations that we have done 
and that we have done as a committee during our oversight is that uh, in terms of the uh, uh, SAPO is concerned, the ICASA is not adequately monitoring, ensuring that 1 kg parcel couriers are observed by uh, uh, so post office competitors, um, logistic couriers business, as they, in terms of the law, the 1 kg couriers are reserved by, for SAPO in terms of the law. So ICASA is not uh, also assisting us in that regard. That is one observation that we did. Another observation that we did is that most of the, uh, of the facilities of uh, South African post offices are, are not accessible to people with disabilities. And you remember that uh, SAPO is also dealing with the issue of uh, uh, grants now so it means elderly people are unable to access our post offices. So those are some of the observations that we did. After those observations, we also visited the uh, ICASA uh, BBI. Um, and after that, the committee made the following recommendations. The first one is that the Minister of Communication should ensure that there is coordination among relevant state-owned companies to resolve any discrepancies such as the one identified in the post office. That is where ICASA is supposed to monitor SAPO competitors in terms of handling of the 1 kg um, reserved, parcels reserved for SAPO. The other recommendation is that ministers should ensure that all SAPO branches are made to be accessible to people with disabilities and elderly people so that uh, uh, they are more comfortable when, when accessing the grants through the post office. The, the other recommendations that we put forward to the council is that we, we need to resolve the problem of state-owned entities and to make sure that ministers should ensure that the proposed measure between Centec and Broadbrand uh, Infraco uh, is, is also facilitated in a manner that will not impose financial risk to us, looking at the challenges of the economy that we we are facing. So we, we submit the report, uh, uh, House Chairperson. Thank you, uh, Chairperson. Um, that concludes the debate. I shall now put the question. The question is that the report be agreed to in according, accordance with Rule 71. I shall first allow provinces the opportunity to make their declaration of vote if they so wish. There's none. We shall now proceed to the voting of the, of the provinces. I shall now do this alphabetically order per province. Eastern Cape. Eastern Cape, yeah, Ikasa. State. State, yes, sir. Yes. Mazulu Natal. Mazulu Natal, yes, sir. Limpopo. Limpopo, ya vum. Pumalanga. Pumalang, ya vum. Northern Cape. Kapabukone, ya tumelana li report. Not West. Stem Sam. Western Cape. Support. Now we have all the head of the delegate voted. If so, voting will now close. The number of the provinces voted in favor, I therefore declare the report agreed to in terms of the section 65 of the constitution. That concludes the business of the day. Honorable members, you are requested to remain standing until the procession has left the house. The house is adjourned. Thank you.